afternoon and thank you for joining us. As of today, we have administered 362,505 doses of COVID-19 vaccine in Wisconsin. And 69,077 of those were second doses, which means that 69,077 Wisconsinites have completed their vaccine series. Last week, we expanded COVID-19 vaccine eligibility to include Wisconsinites age 65 and older. Vaccinations have started for this population, and since this group is over 700,000 strong, it will take some time to get to everyone, but we will get there. While we work to vaccinate our healthcare workers, residents and staff of long-term care facilities and our 65 and older adults, we want to announce the next group that will be eligible for COVID-19 vaccine in preparation, even if, vac if vaccinations will not start for them quite yet. When they do, we will prioritize educators, teachers and childcare workers, followed by Wisconsinites who are enrolled in Medicaid long-term care programs, public-facing essential workers like 911 operators, public transit and grocery store employees, non-frontline healthcare personnel, and staff and residents of congregate living facilities like shelters serving our homeless neighbors. Our tentative start date for these groups, starting with educators and childcare workers, is March 1st, although it will depend on our federal allocation of vaccine. If our allocation increases, then we'll be able to move up that date. If it decreases, we may have to postpone it. It is our fervent hope that we will see an increase because, as we've said before, we need more vaccine from the federal government to meet the needs of our state quickly. Deciding how to prioritize vaccinations is a difficult process. We want everyone who wants a vaccine in Wisconsin to get a vaccine, and in the future that will be a reality. But with our current federal allocation, this is not a reality today. So we need to prioritize and after taking the recommendations from the State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee into consideration and weighing each population's level of exposure and level of vulnerability for severe illness or death from a COVID-19 infection, we decided on this plan for rollout. These are difficult decisions and we do not take this responsibility lightly. COVID-19 is still very present in our state. Residents of Wisconsin are still getting infected and are still dying of this virus. We need to move as quickly and equitably as possible to vaccinate Wisconsinites. And that is what we at DHS and all of our public health and healthcare partners are doing. We know this is urgent. We are adding another 1,301 new cases of COVID today, which brings our total confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our state to 535,218 people. Our seven day average of cases is 1,545. That is lower than it has been in months, and it is also still far, far too high. We each need to recommit to our efforts to stop the spread. Stay home, wear a mask, physically distance, wash your hands, and get tested if you have symptoms or have been exposed, because these efforts are what will save lives right now. Today, we are also reporting 54 more Wisconsinites who have died from COVID-19 which brings the total number of deaths in our state to 5,733. Our thoughts continue to be with the families and friends who have lost loved ones to this virus. And this is why we must continue to use preventive measures and keep on getting every vaccine in arms as fast as we can. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Elizabeth, and we welcome your questions.
Thank you, Deputy Secretary. And a reminder to all to maintain audio quality, please remain muted until it is time to ask your question. If you're on the phone and you are able to do so, use star six to mute and to unmute. And we begin with Brian O'Connor at the Racine County Eye. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I had a quick question uh, related to uh, variants. Have we seen in testing results and uh, any of the initial um, any initial testing the presence of any of the variants from South Africa, Britain, any other locations yet in Wisconsin? Yes, we have um, identified at least one case with the with the variant from Great Britain. Um, and so um, we know that is present in our state. We continue to do um, uh, surveillance for all of the variants. And it is one of the reasons I would just re-emphasize the importance of all of the preventive measures that we have mentioned, that I just mentioned in my opening remarks. Um, the key issue with the variants is they are far more infectious and will spread far more quickly than um, the original uh, version of COVID-19. And we sure don't wanna see that happening in our state and experiencing what we experienced this fall with um, record numbers of cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Thank you. Next question to Todd Richmond at the Associated Press. Todd Richmond. Hi there. Um, I'm wondering, are you seeing any changes in allocations from the Biden administration? Have they been promising that you'll get more than the 70000 $70, a week? And if so, how much more? And, and how would that change the game for you? So we, we do not have any updated numbers from the Biden administration at this point in time. Um, the last prediction we heard from the federal government was from a conversation with Operation Warp Speed, actually the day before the inauguration. Um, I, I have met with leaders from the Biden administration along with other state health officials, um, and they are working on uh, solidifying what the uh, inventories and estimations are and have promised um, full transparency with us as we move forward. Um, we have not yet received our allocation for next week, so I will tell you, my fingers are crossed, <laughs> that it will be higher than it has been. Uh, but last week's allocation was steady, just as the Operation Warp Speed people had indicated it likely would be for the next few weeks. Um, what we need, um, you know, we would love to have 80% coverage um, by the end of June. That would be a six month period of rolling out this vaccine. In order to do that, we need three times the number of doses we're getting now, probably a little bit more than that, because every week we don't have it. We get a little farther behind in trying to achieve that goal. So if we could get um, three, I'd, I'd be really happy if we had three times the number of doses we're getting right now. Um, just to give you a sense of our vaccinator capacity, last week, knowing the eligible groups and knowing that we weren't likely to get a whole lot more vaccine, our vaccinators requested over double what we were able to give them. And so um, that leads me to believe um, with great confidence that we have vaccinator capacity out there um, to get these vaccines rolling. We just need more. Thank you for that. The next question to David Wahlberg at the Wisconsin State Journal. David. Yes, thank you. Um, Wisconsin still ranks near the bottom among states, according to the CDC, in terms of doses given per capita. Why does that continue to be the case? Do you think that will change? And when might that be turned around? So David, um, a couple of things um, continue to influence that. Um, and one I know you've heard from us before, but it continues to um, keep us held back is the number of doses that we have tied up in the pharmacy program for long-term care and the cadence with which that program is, is running. It's uh, 200,000 doses as of last week. That was almost a third of our doses. And um, as of right now, um, we've given a, 
or we being CVS and Walgreens has given about 41,000 of those 200,000 doses. So um, part of that is because we couldn't initiate that assisted living program until later in January when we'd saved up enough doses. Um, and what we're doing about that is um, CVS and Walgreens are now moving into assisted living facilities. We are also um, taking some of the assisted living facilities back from them and um, we have independent pharmacies and local health departments who are going to contribute to that effort to accelerate it. And we are also um, now at a point in the program that we're working with the two pharmacy chains to see how many of the doses that were uh, estimated for them actually need to be used by them and will likely be taking some of those doses back and getting them into the bloodstream of our other vaccinators um, very soon. The second thing I would say is that um, each state designed their systems a little bit differently and Wisconsin has relied on the um, healthcare system, our pharmacy system, our local health departments, um, for delivery of vaccine um, and we continued to focus on that in these early stages and because we knew vaccine supply was going to be limited we did not set up big high throughput uh, vaccine centers that a few of the other states did in these earlier stages. As you've heard we're preparing to do that as vaccine supply increases um, but that has made a little bit of a difference in the pacing of vaccine. So those are two reasons, um, but we are moving vaccine. We are increasing the number of uh, vaccinations that get through the system each week. And uh, we are moving forward. I think the thing about when you look at something with rankings, um, if you get uh, at the back of a pack of runners, you're, you may all still be finishing the race at the same pace, but those at the back um, will still be at the back at the end but we're all moving forward. And I think that is the most important thing to remember here is we are moving forward. We gave over 105,000 vaccines last week um, and we will, I estimate, give even more than that this week. Stephanie, would you add anything further to that? No, nothing, thank you. <laughs> thank you both. Let's go to Rob Sussman at WTAQ in Green Bay, Rob. Oh yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, with this uh, re announcement of the next group that uh, is going to be getting the vaccine, um, when exactly uh, would that open? I know you had mentioned early March, but how much of the 65 plus contingent uh, do you want to get through before opening up the next phase of the vaccination process? So Rob, um, when we looked at phase one, um, we looked at phase 1A, our healthcare workers and our long-term care residents, we opened up, began to open up to other populations when we estimated we were about 50% of the way through. And so we're using that same estimate for us right now. If we were to continue to receive 70,000 first doses a week, we would be about 50% of the way through the 65 plus population by March 1st. So that's the rationale we're using around that estimation of March 1st. We will not be done with people who are 65 plus on March 1st, but we'll be far enough along that uh, we feel like it would likely, assuming a steady vaccine supply, be reasonable to begin to add others into the group. And I think that's part of what keeping um, the rate of vaccination going is really important is we know across our state, different parts of the state will finish groups at different times. Some of our smaller counties were able to get through phase 1A much quicker than some of our larger counties. And so we want to be advancing these different populations at a way that allows everybody across our state to continue to move forward in vaccinating um, as, as we um, move along. Thank you. Let's go to Stephanie Hoff at WIS Politics. Stephanie Hoff. Good afternoon and thanks for taking my call today. 
Uh, my question is for the Deputy Secretary. I'm wondering how DHS justifies putting uh, prisoners over people, uh, for example, ages 60, but high risk. And then uh, the same for, you know, putting prisoners over uh, manufacturers, which was also recommended by the Federal Advisory Committee. Thank you. So we know that um, people who live in congregate settings are at great risk for the disease. And the rationale that both the SDMAC used and we feel is a very rational premise for how we make decisions about this are people who are at greatest risk for spread of the disease and sequelae of the disease and greatest risk of exposure. So as we looked at these populations, uh, those were the criteria that were used. When, when the committee looked at congregate settings, they certainly had robust conversations about whether to include people who were incarcerated or not in the, in the population. But from a perspective of those principles of the risk of disease spread and the risk of sequelae of living in a congregate setting, it did not seem reasonable to exclude prisoners from that based on those criteria. I think the other thing that's really important to remember is that outbreaks in a prison have an effect on the community as well. It's not like it's contained within a prison. When inmates become ill from this illness, they spread it to the people who work in the prison and the people who work in the prison go out into the community and spread it to others. And so um, as you look at the whole ecosystem of how this disease spreads, that provides another rationale for why it, uh, we believe it was reasonable and rational to include all people who live in congregate settings, including uh, uh, people in correctional settings in this group. Thank you for that. Let's go to Brittany Schmidt, WBAY in Green Bay. Brittany Schmidt. Hi, so you talked a little bit about how the, you expected this to be a messy rollout, whether people were calling, um, getting on wait lists, we've heard people getting on multiple wait lists, those 65 and older. What are you hearing from them? And then also, um, for those that have gotten the second dose already, are we seeing the impact of that um, preventing spread within healthcare organizations from their workers? Um, I know that the, we haven't done much with general public, so to speak, yet, so we wouldn't see that out, you know, out in general public, but any report on that? Well, let me start and I'll turn to um, Dr. Schauer about the impact of the people who've had second doses. But certainly what we're hearing is that people are getting through to their healthcare providers. Um, we are seeing pictures on social media of people over age 65 holding up their vaccine cards, just like we saw healthcare workers in the early days. Um, we are seeing healthcare systems rise to the challenges they have throughout this pandemic um, and set up systems, as you said, waiting lists if everybody can't get in right away, um, at least knowing they're on the list and they will get a call for an appointment. And so, um, you know, I, I anticipate we'll have 70,000 people age 65 and plus or more vaccinated this week because this is a big population and people are eager um, to get moving forward. So we know some people are still waiting. Uh, we know not everyone can be in that first week of holding up their vaccine card, um, but I think um, people are preparing systems, implementing systems, and over the next week or two, we'll see even more. Dr. Schauer, would you like to talk about the impact of people who have had their second dose? Yeah, so I think it's a little bit too early to know the exact impact. Uh, as folks recall, that, that um, the vaccines that are being used right now are two-dose series, either separated by 21 days or 28 days. So folks are just starting to get those. And it does take a couple of weeks after you've received that to get the full benefit of protection um, normally when we think about vaccines. So I anticipate that we, this is something that we are continuing to watch and look over, but uh, it's a little bit too early to tell 
it is important for those folks to continue using the PPE and the protections that they have. And we do certainly hope that this lends towards healthier communities. We're just, we're, it's just a little bit too early. So stay tuned. All right, thank you for that. Let's go to Katrina Nickel, Fox 11 in Green Bay. Katrina. Hi there, thanks for taking my call. Um, so we understand that people need to be patient and wait the turn to get the vaccine. But for people who are eligible in these current phases that are waiting, are you seeing that there are certain areas in the state where supply is higher than demand or vice versa? No, I would tell you everywhere in the state, um, demand is higher than supply. <laughs> um, we, as I said last week, our, the, and the weekly cadence is that our vaccinators uh, request a certain number of doses uh, and then we allocate those doses based on uh, a formula. And it, we had vaccinators everywhere in the state asking for more vaccine than we had available. And so those reductions had to be made accordingly across the state. Thank you for that. Let's go now to Derricka Williams, Fox 6 in Milwaukee. Derricka. Hello, thanks for taking my question. Um, quick question, what is the anticipated number in this next population that you're expecting with the teachers and everybody starting on March 1st? And then also, um, where do people with kind of pre-existing conditions who are more likely to have, you know, deaths and reactions from COVID-19, where do they fall in the priority list? Mm -hmm. So there's approximately uh, 600,000 people in this next group that will become eligible or will, we hope will be able to start receiving vaccine on March 1st. So only a little bit smaller than our 65 plus um, organiz uh, population, sorry. Um, in terms of people with other chronic conditions, well, first of all, many of them are 65 and older, so they're eligible right now. Um, and for people younger than that, um, they will certainly be given full consideration uh, in subsequent phases after um, this next eligible one. Um, we understand that is challenging. We understand also that people who have some of the conditions that put them most at risk need to stay home anyway. So for example, if you're immunocompromised right now, with the level of COVID in your community, you need to stay home um, and protect yourself. And so um, I know you want this vaccine and I know you want the rate of disease to go down in the community. And we are working very hard to make sure both of those things happen. And I anticipate those populations will follow shortly um, as we consider who's next after the current group. Thank you. The next question to Angelica Levito, Bloomberg News. Angelica. A reminder, star six will mute and unmute your phone. Angelica at Bloomberg News. All right, let's move on to Rupa Paula, WKOW in Madison. Rupa. Hi, this is Jennifer with WKW, standing in for Rupa. Thank you. Um, my question is about the Brazil specific variant. We heard yesterday that it was found in Minnesota. Has that one specifically been found here in Wisconsin? And with these new variants, we're hearing people talking about adding additional protections or anything like that. Is anything like that recommended? You know, do you have any specific recommendations or should people be wearing two masks? We've heard things like that. Um, just what recommendations do you have for people right now? Yeah, um, Dr. Schauer, I don't know if you have any further information about the surveillance on the variants. Um, I am not aware that the Brazil variant has been found in Wisconsin. Are you? That is correct. I do not know that information. I think it's important to remember that um, we do expect, um, you know, viruses constantly change through mutation and new variants are expected to occur over time. Um, most variants don't change how the virus behaves and many disappear, but it is possible that mutations can help vi the virus spread more easily or cause infection to be either more or less severe or can lead to resistance to treatments or vaccines. 
I think it's important to note that um, here in Wisconsin, the State Laboratory of Hygiene, as well as other laboratory partners regularly work together to ensure whole genome sequencing is done on a small proportion of the positive tests. And these sequences are then compared to known sequences, um, and that's how these, this type of information is, is gleaned. Um, in addition, clinicians are asked to promptly notify DHS of individuals who have had a positive PCR test and meet certain criteria, such as having traveled in the last 30 days, contact with someone who's had a case and traveled in the last 30 days, et cetera. And so it's by these types of surveillance methods that are ongoing, um, both for COVID, but also for influenza, um, that we are able to identify if um, those types of variants were to be in the state. And so let me also double down on this is no time to remove a mask mandate in our state. And that's why the governor issued one last week um, and why it continues to be incredibly important that whether that mandate stands or not, everybody in our state continue to wear a mask to physically distance. Um, you are correct. I have heard Dr. Fauci and others recommend two masks um, uh, and you know, that's not going to hurt anyone <laughs> to wear two masks. But really, with these variants out there, um, the, the recommendations around staying home, uh, not socializing with lots of people, keeping your mask on, washing your hands, and uh, physical distancing remain incredibly critical behaviors in order for us to contain the spread of the virus. Because even with vaccine, if we have very high levels of virus circulating in the community, we will continue to have spread. And so we need to both be bringing down the rate of disease and increasing vaccination rates. And so it's not one or the other, it's both and. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to Maddie Heim at the Appleton Post Crescent. Maddie Heim. Hi, thanks for doing this call. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about uh, why mink farmers are in the 1B group and kind of what we hope to gain or hope to prevent by vaccinating that specific population sooner rather than later. Thanks. Dr. Schauer, would you like to talk about that? Sure. And so I, just to reiterate, this is a quite a small group, but an important group to, um, to note. This is for biosecurity reasons, is um, it is that mink can be infected by um, the SARS-CoV-19 virus and to make sure that we don't have a situation like we had in Denmark where a large number of mink had to be culled um, due to infection. We want to go ahead and protect those individuals that are involved in that work so that um, they can continue to work and we don't have that additional risk here in Wisconsin. As I said, it's a very small number of individuals, several hundred. And so we're working with local public health to make sure that those individuals are taken care of. And just to add on to that, that biosecurity risk has to do with mink to human and human to mink transmission and the risk of mutation as that happens. And so that's why um, this population is particularly important to avoid um, both those uh, challenges to, to the mink farmers, but also the potential spread beyond them if that were to happen. Thank you for that. Uh, next question to Jessica Van Egeren, Up North News. Jessica. Um, yes, thanks for taking my call. Um, I wanted to just clarify a question that was asked earlier. You talked about how when you open up an, the, another phase that you typically like to have 50% of the original um, the phase before it completed. So I was wondering, as far as phase 1A is concerned, the healthcare workers and long-term care residents, is the percentage of that population still at around 50% or is it higher now? Thank you. We made that, it's, it's hard to know exactly when we are there. So these are gross estimates. And when we made the decision to open up to um, 
age 65 plus, we were over 250,000 people who had received their first vaccine, and that would be about 50% of that first population. Now, as I said, that's not true across the state. If you go to a smaller county like Pierce County, I mean, I, I, they had reported to us that they had taken care of all of their 1A populations. But if you go to a big county like Milwaukee County, they were still vaccinating phase 1A. So it's not going to be equal across the state. Um, but it helps us, you know, we need to be sure to be adding in populations to make sure our vaccinators have uh, people available that they can vaccinate. And I think that's what we did very effectively when we added in the 65 plus population as evidenced by the sudden increase in both the number of vaccinators asking for vaccine last week and the number of doses that they were asking for. So it's keeping this proper balance in place not to overwhelm the vaccination system, but to keep enough people coming in that we can keep the vaccine flowing. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question to McKenna, McKenna Alexander at WQOW in Eau Claire. McKenna. Hey, thanks for taking my call. So here in Western Wisconsin, we've seen some of our local healthcare providers up their staffing to accommodate for such a large population now eligible to be vaccinated. But for rural healthcare systems, that's not always an option. So is there anything the state is doing to help these smaller communities stay on track with completing each phase? Thank you. Absolutely. And I will tell you, actually, some of our smaller communities are doing uh, absolutely great. And so I know it varies from community to community and resource to resource, how many staff are in their local health department, how many staff are in their local health care system. But um, I do want to say, um, sometimes I think the, the smaller rural communities um, are, are have their systems very well put together um, and are um, performing on a very high level. However, one of the things that we have done to supplement every community, whether they be very small or big, and have uh, needs around increased vaccination is our new mobile vaccination teams that we just launched last week. And this is very similar to the testing teams we put together um, uh, earlier in the pandemic to support um, enhancing health systems and public health uh, across the state. Um, there are uh, teams of National Guard members and also civilian um, members of the team and volunteers, including a number of students from across the UW system who are studying in the health sciences. And so these teams are available. Local health departments can request them and they will go out uh, for a day and do a vaccination clinic in a community for eligible populations to help fill in those gaps and places um, that are um, needing further assistance to get populations in their community vaccinated. Thank you. The next question to Amanda Quintana, WISC in Madison. Amanda. Hi, yes, thank you. So this, this group is, is listed by priority. So similarly to moving from the 65 and older to this next group, are we going to wait to do 50% of educators and then move to people in the Medicaid and long-term care programs? Or is this entire list going to be eligible all at once? The entire list is going to be eligible all at once. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, Chuck Kornbach, WUWM Milwaukee. Chuck? Good afternoon. Uh, could you clarify the status of the grocery workers for March 1st? Are they in, out, and uh, what went into the state's decision for grocery workers, please? Yes. Um, the the State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee recommended that everybody along uh, the food chain uh, supply, the food supply chain uh, be included. And so that includes everyone from agricultural workers to those who work in food processing plants to those who uh, assist with selling food or giving food out through charitable organizations. So um, that does include grocery store workers and workers at other um, facilities that sell groceries like um, convenience stores um, and also 
uh, farmers markets and also again people who work in places like food pantries that um, uh, provide charitable um, food distribution. Thank you for that. Next question to Melanie Conklin, Wisconsin Examiner. Melanie. Melanie at Wisconsin Examiner. All right, let's try to get back Back to Melanie, we'll go to Tom Durian, uh, TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Tom. Hi there, a couple questions here. Uh, first, the vaccine timeline, a lot of school districts uh, are, were planning on getting teachers vaccinated as part of their return to the classroom uh, plans. And I wondered if this timeline is going to slide that a little bit. Also, uh, in our area, we've seen some events starting to cancel for 2021 events in June. Uh, does it look like that's what we're going to see continuing to happen as we get later and later into the year, despite the vaccine rollout? Yeah. Um, so to your first question uh, about teachers, um, if school districts are waiting until all of their teachers are fully vaccinated, um, this could uh, defer time that they were going to come in. Um, vaccine, as, uh, as Dr. Schauer has mentioned, uh, depending on which vaccine you uh, use, takes either three weeks between the first two doses or four weeks. So um, school districts will need to take that into consideration as uh, we move forward here. Um, I think, you know, everything comes back to how much vaccine we have and then how many people actually accept it. And so I think events, big events earlier in the summer are going to be very challenging. Um, and, you know, as I have heard Dr. Fauci speak about this, he points more towards late summer fall when we may be in a better position to be having large gatherings but it really is contingent on how quickly manufacturers can manufacture vaccine, how many vaccines we have, how quickly it can be distributed to the states and our local vaccinators, and how quickly they can get it in arms. And as I've said, we're working, you know, we've got the system in place to put more vaccines in arms um, if we can get those vaccines. But all of this is brand new. Um, these vaccines are brand new, particularly Moderna and Pfizer are brand, brand new. It's brand new technology. And so, um, as I've said, I'm not a manufacturer. I don't know what the challenges are, but I can only imagine that they're um, troubleshooting a lot of things as they start to produce millions and millions and millions of doses. Um, and we'll have new manufacturers coming on. And so I think it's really hard to, to say exactly when we'll have enough of the population ready. And so I think event planners who have to plan ahead and have to make um, good guesses about how much investment they wanna put in things now um, uh, are maybe in a very good position to be deferring things that would be in the late spring, early summer until later. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question to Mary Spacuza, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Mary. Thanks for doing this call. Um, I wanted to ask about the role that independent pharmacies have played in Wisconsin's rollout and are there any plans to expand their role? I know Dr. Showers worked a lot with the pharmacies, so let me turn to you for that question. Sure. So independent pharmacies really are a key player in this whole uh, campaign. And we currently have independent pharmacies who have signed up and are approved as um, providers and are starting to provide vaccine to the eligible groups. In particular, we've done some surveys of them regarding their readiness and willingness to go ahead and help out in local communities and have shared that information with local health departments. So as they identify needs in their community, if that is something that is needed as an additional vaccinator or location, that the pharmacies are there and willing to help and, and really making that connection. So they certainly 
certainly are starting um, to play a bigger role as we move forward. Um, in addition, they are also um, helping out with some of the um, assisted living facilities. As we mentioned, in Wisconsin, we have many of them that are very small, less than 10 beds, and those are perfect places where um, an, a local pharmacy or an independent pharmacy may be able to provide that capacity right away. Thank you for that. Uh, now to Heather Poltrop, WSAW in Wausau. Heather. Hi, thank you. Um, so when it comes to the, the vaccination phases, I feel like for 65 plus, it was pretty easy to prove just through a driver's license. Can you talk about some of the vetting or the verification that'll be done for the groups that are eligible based on their occupation? How will they prove who they are? So there's a number of ways uh, we can approach that. And it's also one of the advantages, I think, of announcing this on January 26th and not starting until March 1st. So one way is to vaccinate people on site at their work site. That's a pretty easy way to verify that you're an employee of a grocery store or a transit company or a school district. Um, another way um, we've uh, encouraged with our unaffiliated healthcare providers, because we've already crossed this bridge um, with that group, is encouraging our vaccinators to use one of a variety of methods to ask for verification. It could be showing your employee work badge. It could be bringing a pay stub that indicates you work for one of these eligible groups. Or it could be signing an attestation saying, you know, I am an employee of um, you know, X grocery store, or X school district. So, um, you know, we want to get to these groups with as few barriers in place as possible, um, but with some level of, of um, checking to, to uh, ask people to be honest about um, their employment in one of these groups. Thank you for that. Uh, next question to Kim Shine at CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Kim? CBS 58. All right, we'll try to come back to that outlet. Let's go to Nikki Medanovich, uh, WMTV in Madison. Nikki. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you for doing this. I have a question about um, is sort of refusal rates, if they've seen uh, vaccine refusal uh, healthcare, uh, for healthcare workers. Um, you know, if they've seen that, is that, uh, are those numbers alarming? Dr. Schauer, any data you have on that? We don't, that isn't something that we are routinely collecting now, unfortunately. It is something that I think is important to go ahead and address. And we have been providing, you know, resources and training to um, vaccinators and healthcare entities to address this particular situation so that we can ensure that those numbers are as low as possible. We know it's important that people get their questions answered around vaccines um, ahead of time. And so really providing many resources um, and trainings uh, and information so that people can feel reassured when they show up or when it's time for them to be vaccinated. So it is something that we are concerned about in providing that information, um, recognizing that that's a key part of the success of this campaign. One thing I would add to that as well is that it's, um, you know, for example, healthcare providers are initially offered the vaccine in their employment setting, and they may not be quite ready to accept it the first time it's offered. But another piece of the strategy to continue to help people with their decision making is to continue to offer the vaccine in subsequent settings too. Because we know some people are hesitant at the beginning. They want to see how this goes. They want to see how it rolls out for the first few months. And if they see it going well, and um, you know, the absence of severe side effects, they'll be ready a month or two from now. So it doesn't mean you just get offered once and that's it, but how, how do you have the opportunity um, as you think about it more and gain more information to continue to opt in um, uh, in subsequent uh, months? Uh, next question to Mason Dowling at WAOW in Wausau, Mason. 
Hi, thanks for taking this call. Uh, my question is just in regards to addressing a few rumors. Obviously, uh, once uh, people have both doses of the vaccination, uh, is it similar to the flu vaccine where they could still catch COVID but just have lower, uh, I, I guess, lower symptoms? Or is it a complete immunity? Thank you. Dr. Schauer? So the vaccine provi provides very good protection, but nothing in life is 100%. Um, and so there is a very small risk, but the risk is, is low. Um, I will say some of the pieces that we are still trying to learn and figure out is if someone who has been fully vaccinated, if they can actually acquire the, the virus and perhaps, as you said, may have minimal symptoms and or can go ahead and transmit that. So those are two key pieces that we don't know, but that are currently being studied. Um, but I will say uh, in terms of your best bet in helping to prevent from getting sick, vaccination is the way to go. For that, uh, Tim Stum, Wisconsin Health News. Tim Stum. Hi, thanks for uh, holding this call today. Um, this morning, the uh, Assembly Health Committee advanced a bill that would, among other things, require the state to open vaccinations to the general public by mid-March. Uh, the committee's chair, Joe Sanfilippo, who is the author of the bill, said there's been a lack of urgency by DHS on the vaccine rollout, um, and he repeated comments that he's made before that he thinks the process has been, quote, bungled and mismanaged. What's your response to this bill and also to the chair's remarks about the state's vaccine rollout? Well, I take issue with uh, anyone thinking a system that within just a little bit over a month has delivered 362,000 vaccines to the citizens of Wisconsin is a bungled system. I think it's a system that is working very well. And um, as to uh, no sense of urgency, I'd love to invite the uh, representative to come meet the hundreds of people who are working day and night to make this system work, both at uh, state government and in our vaccinating entities across the state. Um, in terms of opening up vaccine to everyone by mid-March, um, I think you've heard from us why we think that is not possible, not a good idea, certainly possible, but um, the, the chaos, the uh, uh, the rush to vaccine we saw with people over age 65, if we quintupled the number of people trying to get in the system at the same time, would completely overwhelm the system. And so without a significant increase in vaccine, um, we don't think that's the best strategy. There will be a time that we will open up to everybody. Um, and it will be after we've gotten some significant populations of people already vaccinated. So it's not all 4.6 million adults in Wisconsin coming in. It will be a smaller subset of those because people have already been vaccinated. So um, I think our system is moving forward. We are vaccinating many people. We are accelerating every week and um, we are getting the vaccine that the federal government has provided us out into the arms of people of Wisconsin. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. Uh, next question to Rebecca Spaulding, Thomson Reuters, Rebecca Spaulding. All right, uh, how about Dan Malloy, Spectrum News. Dan? Hi there, thanks for taking our questions again. Um, I'm curious if the department gives any specifics as to the best ways for say a school district to vaccinate its, uh, its population of employees or to a certain jail or prison system, the best way to vaccinate all of the workers and uh, population living there. Uh, does DHS make specific recommendations or what does that guidance look like if not? So DHS has been doing a couple of things, um, particularly with school systems. And um, we've also been reaching out to other groups who will be in this, um, this next uh, group. Um, we have been working closely with the Department of Public Instruction, getting information out to school districts. 
Uh, we've surveyed them to see who already has plans in place, and many, many of them do. Um, many school districts either have a contract with a health system that provides health services for them. They work very closely with their local health departments who are preparing to provide vaccination for their uh, teachers and staff. Um, or they may have their own school staff who are in a position to do that. Um, and so uh, what we are recommending is that this is a great time for planning uh, for who will provide those vaccines. Um, and again, if a school district wants to do their own vaccination with their own staff, they can apply to be an eligible vaccinator through our registration system and receive uh, vaccine directly from us. We know that uh, employers can do the same thing, um, and uh, many are. I was speaking with a group of CEOs this week, and one of them was talking about their employee health department having applied to be a vaccinator having received vaccine, and we're vaccinating their employees who are 65 and older at this point in time. So um, there's, as we've said, there's not one avenue that's the right avenue for each entity. There are many avenues that they can select, and that is why we are um, ever increasing the number of vaccinators in our state that um, employers or school districts or county or state government can contract with or partner with to um, uh, achieve vaccination in their setting. Thank you. Uh, let's try to get back to Melanie Conklin at Wisconsin Examiner. Melanie Conklin. Hi, uh, actually I, I apologize for missing the first chance, but um, my question was on the prison population and what the points the legislators or certain legislators were making. And I think you've addressed that unless you have anything to add. I think I did address that. Thank you, <laughs> Melanie. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, how about Kim Shine at CBS 58? Kim Shine. Okay, Angelica Levito, Bloomberg. Angelica at Bloomberg. Well, and the final question, if she's here, is Rebecca Spaulding. Rebecca, Thomson Reuters. All right, with that, we will wrap up today's briefing. We wanna thank Deputy Secretary Julie Willems Van Dyke, Dr. Stephanie Schauer, and all of you for participating. Please continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a great afternoon.